Welcome to another episode of the Underground Bunker Podcast. I'm really thrilled this week to have with me one of the legends. One of the legends. We're talking about somebody who's so important in the history on, of Scientology come on, come on, come on. and the internet. Get off it. I'm talking about Dennis Ehrlich. Look, he's already grouchy and we haven't even started. That's no, a... <laughs> no, I'm just amused that you would <laughs> put me at some kind of a lofty level. Oh, it's incredible. I don't look... <laughs> you, you know, I've been uh, I've been reading about you and, and we've been trading messages for years. Mm -hmm. Last week, I was in Los Angeles uh, covering the uh, hearing of Leah Remini's lawsuit, and you reached out to me. Uh, I, was, I was thrilled. We decided to get together. We had lunch. We had a nice talk, and uh, we decided we'd do this. You know, it's about time uh, people heard from you. It's been quite a while, and uh, but I want to preface things. I know people may have some idea that you were very important in the battle between Scientology and the Internet in 1995. But there's actually more to your story than that. Some really important, interesting things recently. But there are three three things we're going to go into that I want to go into to learn more about who Dennis Ehrlich is. We're going to be spending some time in November 1966, February 1995, and December 2021. So let's go back to 1966. It's, uh, you know, the, the 60s are starting to really happen. We're talking Sunset uh, Strip in Hollywood, November 1966. There is this famous incident that a lot of people see as the real start of the 60s and a countercultural moment that took place in a club called Pandora's Box. On uh, it was actually uh, it was actually on the steps, to the front steps, because they had already closed Pandora's box. So Pandora's box was like the whiskey, right? Like the Roxy or something, some kind of a well-known uh, nightclub. No, absolutely. So uh, tell me about because it was gone by the time you know it was gone soon after that. But tell me what happened that night and why you're involved. Well. Uh... I, I was uh, a part of a trio that was playing um, from the back of a black back uh, uh, a flatbed truck with a generator along Sunset Strip. Any any place we could park, like a, a parking lot that wasn't being used, or any place like that, we would pull in set up and and start playing and that would be uh we draw a crowd and and pretty soon the the uh county sheriffs would swoop in chase chase away the crowd and we would pack up very nicely we were never harassed because uh you know just we would just pack up and move to the next place or the next time we could do it so um and and the the strip was a the the cultural center of the, the uh, let me see the counterculture that derived from the use of LSD. It took because LSD took took uh, a counterculture way out of proportion of, that anybody had ever seen before. Just right now, things changed for those people. So the, it's on the strip, everybody was walking back and forth on the sidewalk and waiting, waiting for, it was a big freak show, all right? It was just like, the, uh, you know, the straight people who came along there to see the freaks, right? The hippies who were trying to emulate the freaks, and there were people who walked around on LSD and they were the freaks, you know, they were just out of it. You know, they had the wild haircuts, they they dressed different, they, and they sort of, they were outsiders, outside of everybody. And this was, and this was Hollywood. And I read that that particular night, Jack Nicholson and Peter Fonda were there. Yeah, well, uh, let me tell you, it was spurred on by Wolfman Jack, who that night got wind of it and called out all the 
whoever on the radio to come to this protest. It was in protest of how kids were being handled, really, on the strip. And they were being bullied, and, and some of them were being, you know, physically attacked uh, by the county sheriff. And the, and they, the, and city, the, county sh the city had actually enacted a curfew so that anyone under 21 was supposed to go home by 10 o'clock at night. Well, it's, let me make a distinction. Just because the Sunset Strip is in Los Angeles doesn't mean it has its own police force. It's not under the Los Angeles police. It's under the county sheriff, which, you know, they were known to be brutal, especially to kids on the street. So they passed this ordinance, which was you know, get off the street at 10 o'clock if you're under 21 or maybe 18. I forget what it was. And the kids just didn't dig it. You know, <laughs> back then, they, it was like, hey, no, we're not going to get off the street. You know, so there was a lot of confrontations along that line. And finally, uh, you know, there was a counterculture place there, uh, a club was really a coffee house called uh, the Fifth Estate. And lots of commies and socialists and, and anti-society uh, characters hung out there. And they were really kind of the sponsor, if you want to know, uh, of this activity that we were doing. We, we actually played on the roof of the place uh, one time. It didn't work very well because it started raining. <laughs> what did you play? What did you play, Dennis? I played guitar, 12-string guitar, and uh, and I sang. You know, I've always been the singer, you, you know, of the of the times that I've played in bands. So, yeah, I started, you know, the, the place had a lot of traffic. That was probably the heaviest traffic. Uh, intersection in Los Angeles. Sunset and right, Crescent Heights? Right. Right. And in the middle of that, there was an island, and the Pandora's box was on this island. Mm. Right. <clears throat> there was a whole conspiracy theory of why it was being bent, you know, it was being removed. But it boiled down to it was a traffic nightmare for that for that intersection. I bet it was. So, <laughs> but we that wasn't the reason they were tearing it down. It was because Lytton Savings had moved in across the street and they hated this. Da, da, da. You know, they made up a whole conspiracy as to why it was done. So based on that, we were, you know, employed to get on the, the front steps and have this uh, demonstration as a three-piece band, uh, group, uh, combo, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we got up there, and I don't know whether the others in the, in the group were uh, stoned on acid, but I certainly was. And, <laughs> and you know, I, I played, you know, I was only a three-chord strummer at the time, you know. So, uh, but I could put the, put, I could put those chords together with the, the right words and the right, you know, sort of the right singing. So, yeah, I started going and they gathered around and pretty soon there's a, a crowd covering and blocking Sunset Boulevard, which is like a four lane, I think, yeah, four lane uh, uh, boulevard. And so, you know, we kept playing and it was really fun and all this stuff. And the, and the, the sheriffs formed a line and squeezed them tighter and oh. tighter. <laughs> And sort of, uh, uh, it was all physical, you know, elbows and 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 nightsticks and you know that kind of thing. And they were they were, they were sort of gathered up like like uh, cattle by these guys with their cattle prods, and I, they started not to like it. <laughs> is what it boiled down to. 
the crowd started not to like being pushed around. And, you know, we were up there playing and I, I saw the first brick being thrown, you know. So we packed up and split out the back way <laughs> down the hill where our equipment was and drove off in, in our uh, uh, flatbed and left it alone after that. And that's when all the stuff happened. That's when all the, the riot they call the Sunset Strip riot or Pandora's Box riot or Teen Riot or whatever they call it. So that was the riot that started that whole counterculture uh, event. That was like a, the first big of a uh, big counterculture event that wasn't promoted, you know, right. didn't have money involved. Uh, and, and so, yeah. Bob Gibson, manager of the Mamas and the Papas, said, if you had to put your finger on an, an event that was a barometer of the tide turning, it would probably be the Sunset Strip riots. And you were there, yeah, man. So that was, yeah, that was for me a society changing thing that that I had accomplished if I if I can really uh if there was one person that I would call the instigator or the whatever uh of that event, it was me because I was the one who got up in front of everybody and rile, I guess it, I riled them up with music, you know, which is, you know, I, I, I threw freedom on them is really what it was. I projected this freedom on them with that music and LSD seemed to have together. And you were, so, you, um, you were 20 at the time? 20, yeah. I was 20. Excuse me, my nose is running a little bit. How did, uh, so, I mean, that, that's amazing to be part of such an important cultural event. How did that change your personal trajectory, and how the heck did you go from a freedom-wielding musician <laughs> changing the culture to a minion in L. Ron Hubbard's uh, army? Well, First of all, let me get things straight. When I talk about Scientology, I'm talking about uh, Scientology, what they call Scientology's religious technology, what I call their religious brainwashing. So uh, I'm only talking about those technical things that they use. I'm not talking about what the organization of Scientology Inc. does. I'm talking as a minister, because I was a minister of Scientology, and I converted to my own faith. Uh, so I'm still a minister with uh, a 501c3 uh, um, tax exemption. That the, anyway, so I'm, I'm talking about it now from that point of view. And, and so if you have any questions, I'll be answering from the point of view of talking about the technology rather than, <laughs> rather than the organization. You've, the organization has been covered by so many people. It'd be like telling my story is not dramatic. Like well, a, like that, okay, so how, so how do you go from rabble rousing 60s uh, musician to being seduced by Hubbard's technology. Well, now you're talking. Now, now we're getting down to it. Um, okay, I've always been an outcast. I mean, I was even an outcast in my own family. Uh, so in life, I'm, I'm used to being on the other side of society, not fitting in right? Being an outsider always. And, um, and so I was, I was living a, a, a normal life then. I had a wife, I had two children, and um, it didn't quite fit right. You know, the, 
because I had always been, and then I had to be an insider sort of, and I couldn't quite make it, to make it be an insider to society the way they wanted me to, or society demanded I be really in that role. So, uh, so becoming an, an insider was kind of a, a, a goal I had way back when, when I thought it was possible to be an insider, but now I was forced to be. So when I got into Scientology, you know, the, the entrance seems kind of interesting. And back then it, it was a philosophy that had steps and, and really put things together. It was mechanical in a way and could be understood mechanically. So, I got sucked in on Hollywood Boulevard to a lecture, right? Now, the, the technology of Scientology demands that people who reach out to Scientology or have any interest in Scientology are, are attracted and, and, and willing to go through Scientology's what they call process or processing. So it's kind of like a, a huckster, if you will. And what they do is suck in those people who are who are a susceptible to their their front door, you know, just like a huckster doesn't care about the crowd, only cares about the ones who are susceptible. Right. So it's kind of like an open door for us, right? I was susceptible. So I go and I listen to the lecture and communication and all this stuff. What they're really doing is letting you know how you work, what's inside of you. So they're telling you how the process of you is done. And we're going to redo it in your, to make it yours, right? So you own it. Um, and so they start with communication. Now, every step in Scientology, you follow what they call a routing form. You have a piece of paper and you have, you know, course supervisor signs off, and then you're routed, they say, to the registrar for the next course wherein you're given the you know the superpower uh, cell so you route everywhere so they route you to this communications course which seems you know it's a benevolent thing communication da -da 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 -da. Right. sounds like a good thing right so they sit you down and say okay you sit there and you sit there for two hours, you don't blink, you don't move. That's the, uh, first you do it with your eyes closed, you know, whatever they, but they were gonna sit there, just like some school teacher is telling you, go sit in the corner. There's nobody telling you sit there and you do it. Then nobody gets up and leaves. See, that's what I mean, the, they're hooked. They're hooked like a, a, a shuckster would. So um, I hope I'm not going on too long about this. No, I mean, what, one question I've always had is, um, I mean, you just said it. The, the routing form is going to take you to the superpowers. But what's interesting to me is this sort of cognitive dissonance, this disconnect, that on the one hand, they're holding out the idea that if you follow these steps, and you're right, that's kind of seductive. We have a philosophy based on steps, and you just follow them. You're going to end up with superpowers. But then you're made to sit for hours. There's the training routines. There's the objectives. You're lifting bottles. You're touching walls. You're, you know, staring at people. And I keep thinking, does it dawn on people that this is really the path to superpowers? Staring at somebody for two hours? Why, when you're being seduced into that, Dennis, does it not sort of dawn on you that this is just silly parlor tricks that don't lead anywhere. Well, they do. 
that's the point. And where they lead is someplace bad. But in the beginning, there's a feeling that there's something positive about what you're getting out of it. Right. Huh. Gee, if I sit here for how many days and, you know, sit here every day, maybe something's going to happen. So something happens. You know, <laughs> that's the way it, that's, oh, yeah, this is really comfortable. Whatever the, the cognition is that the person gets out of sitting for two hours and not moving. But what's why they can't jump off the train once they're on it? Is that what you're asking? Well, I just, well, to, to me, it's just interesting that, uh, I mean, I do understand there's the euphoria you get from auditing. There's the, uh, the, the cognitions you can have after sitting and staring for hours. But I still, I still wonder, I mean, none of this goes near superpowers. And I, but, but I, it's just interesting to me that you're being asked to stare at people, touch walls, and that's somehow going to lead to the secrets of the universe. I don't know. To me, it just, it seems like, a bizarre disconnect, but I, I guess it works while you're going through it. Well, it, it works both ways, being controlled and controlling others, because they teach you how to be controlled and how to control others. Each drill is done back and forth, so it is done on, you know, one, one twin does it on the other. So you're gaining, you feel like you're gaining uh, con uh, control and, and 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 giving up control at the same time, which kind of is a seductive uh, thing. And, and you, so as you move up, and then and you ended up going very high. I mean, you ended up being cramming officer at Flag in Clearwater, mm -hmm. which you have described as quality control agent at the brainwashing factory, which I love. Um, yeah. and you were, you know, overseeing this, but then you, then you had a problem. They, you, you wanted to improve things. They, they didn't like it and, and you got declared and kicked out. Can we get to the part where you're now disillusioned and uh, this internet thing is starting to come around? What motivated you after you were out to start? I mean, the way it was described to me was ARS was this sleepy little, location on the Usenet with people sort of like uh, discussing Scientology very calmly. And then Dennis Ehrlich showed up and uh, really turned it into a battlefield. Uh, can you can we get to that and, and, and your days on IR, ARS? Because I want to get to the raid. Uh, like I said, we started on sure, November. Sure. We started in November 1966. Now we're going to get to February 1995. You, you've gone through your Scientology journey. You got to a high point. You were cramming officer at flag. You're out now. Tell me about getting on ARS and what that was like. I was chief cramming officer. Let's get that straight. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, yeah. Um, what happened after a, a whole a bunch of adventures getting out? Uh, I ended up connecting, or I was was generously offered a, a, a home in Priscilla. A, 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 excuse me, a room or a, a, a part be part of her family. Priscilla Coates. I don't know if you know that name. She's still kicking. That's so, good to hear. <laughs> so uh, they gave me a room in their house, and. And connected, they were friends with this guy, Clemens Rude, Tom Clemens Rude, who seemed to be some kind of a computer expert, and said, hey, they said, why don't you get connected up with him and, and get on the internet? And at, at, that this, time, at this point, Priscilla was with the Cult Awareness Network? Right. She was, uh, she was president of the local Cult Awareness Network. Thanks for remi reminding me of that. So, yeah, so I started on the Internet and the first there was only two things that you could do on the Internet at the time. You could send an email that worked pretty well, just the same as today. And uh, the other thing was a Usenet groups. Uh, Usenet were anyways, Usenet were where they 
categorized what the subject was, and then they allowed groups to talk about it. And, a, and all religion Scientology was uh, one of those groups. Um, so uh, I got on this on this site, and there were Scientologists at, at talking at the same time as as uh, as others who were against Scientology. So uh, and, and the arguments the Scientologists were making, uh, as usual, were fraudulent. They were not true, right? And nobody could disprove him. It was just a back and forth, right? And and um, I, I'm I'm swallowing because I thought, yeah, if we could just do that with Trump, you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so I got on there, and I knew they were they were lying. I knew. Uh, they didn't, uh, uh, our side, I'd call them, didn't have a, a, a stick to hit back. They didn't have anything to argue back. So I happened to have a, a set of, uh, uh, a green set of policy letters. And um, because I disagreed with their religious policy of keeping their the true activities of their religion secret from the public as a minister and a responsible minister i started uh, exposing those things by ripping pages out of these green things scanning them and and sending them uh, onto ars and you could tell they were authentic because they had all the, you know, the headings all correct and everything. So it was something that that uh, clearly uh, they didn't like. We'll just say that they didn't like. Leave it at that. So um, so I had various threats and letters and things like that. Uh, uh, claiming some kind of uh, inhibition I should have with regard to re uh, 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 exposing these things, right? Um, and I, I just ignored it. Personally, I just ignored it. Like, what do they, what do they think they're going to do, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> what do they think they're going to? No, this is America. You can't do that kind of thing, right? In America. So, yeah, um, to carry out their religious uh, practice of destroying their enemies. Um, and I say that's one of their sacraments, having been in the, in the organization, having been, uh, having seen it all operate on these basic things of control. Um, I would say uh, that's about as far as I can take it without without going over some kind of a line, uh, and that line is it, it is in my memory as to what I was talking about. If you can remind me. Well, so I, I love the way you describe this because you come to ARS, and the way I, I read about it was again you had Scientologists and, and ex Scientologists and non Scientologists discussing Scientology, and as you said, the Scientologists were, of course, not describing the way things were, but you had an advantage. You had been in Scientology, you'd been a minister, you'd been a chief cramming officer, and you had the, the policies. And so you began showing the policies on ARS simply to back up your arguments. And of course, in the United States, we're free to do that under the First Amendment under something called fair use. You can you can quote somebody's work exactly. as long as you're making a <laughs> comment about it. And you were making a comment about it. You weren't just Thanks. like you weren't just like, <laughs> like trying to sell it as your own. That's that's right. a copyright exactly. trademark problem. You're just exactly. saying, look, Scientology says this, and this is how I feel about it. 
completely legal, right. completely protected. But this is the <laughs> early days of the internet. Nobody's entirely sure how things are going to go. Scientology <laughs> wants to stop this thing before it gets any bigger. So then February 1995, people can't believe it. What Scientology actually convinces a federal marshal to come raid your house and take your computer? Well, it's not that big a deal. Let me let me let me explain why. Uh, you know, these judges, it's a I guess it was a judge or a magistrate. I'm not sure how yeah, I don't know that it went above uh, uh the city. I don't know. I don't know what the jurisdiction was to to issue this uh wasn't even a, uh, it wasn't even a, a, what do they call it? legally? It was a, a, a writ of seizure rather than a, well, it wasn't a it search wasn't warrant. A, it was a writ of seizure. Wow. Yeah, exactly. That's the word I was thinking of. It's not a search warrant. They didn't have a right to enter my house. They just had a right to seize something. And now the judge Seeing this internet thing, which it's a new new thing, they see that he's he's ripping off something about the internet. Uh, okay, he's used to seeing CD piles of CDs in garages, and 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 telling you you can go in and take those CDs right, right. from that garage because they're copies of somebody's music, copyrighted right. works, right. right. So the judge, I mean, it's really easy to get one of those, apparently, a rid, rid of seizure. And uh, the judge doesn't care what it really was on the other end specifically, and that's what they used. They used this rid of seizure. So what, what are they seizing, right? They're seizing everything to do with Scientology, the, the, the religion of Scientology. But I mean, they just, uh, they came in your house with a marshal and took all of your computer equipment away? Yeah. And all my, <laughs> and all my discs. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I had several computers, so it wasn't just one computer. I've, by the way, I've never gotten any of this stuff back, you know? <laughs> so anyway, yeah, they just were just whisked it out of there. Thank God somebody was filming it and somebody was taking times that the L.A. Times sent a photographer, which was, uh, you know, he did a great job. And so anyway, there's this big ruckus in my house. Right. I get I get my clothes because <laughs> it was early in the morning. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, yeah, they bust in and and all these uh, Warren McShane, you know, was in charge of it. Uh, anyway, they come in, they take my stuff, and uh, off they go. They had a, a Glendale City policeman there at the door, you know, to tell me, open up. Uh, it had no jurisdiction, but they just brought him along, you know, with a gun in case I got wild or something. So, um, yeah, they just walked off with the stuff and I was left uh, basically holding the bag of uh, what to do legally. And they were suing me, I guess it was in federal court in, in San Jose, it ended up to be. Uh, as a minister, that's kind of disconcerting, but you know, when you're, when you're trying to practice your, your heartfelt uh, religious obligation to have that kind of thing thrust on you from above, clearly from above. Uh, or, or, as the, or as the Christians would say, from below, right? <laughs> well, and that was the start of an amazing year. I mean, Arnie Lerma was raided later in the year in August, and uh, there were raids in Europe. I mean, Scientology was trying to squelch the internet before it could spread further. It was a disaster for them, and you you know it didn't work. But I know you went through a lot of legal pain. I think all of us owe you a debt of gratitude that we can today speak so freely about Scientology on the internet when <laughs> you know you paid the price when you were just citing their own works. It's incredible. 
Yeah, Tony, you should really realize that it was a specific work of philosophy that I exposed that really set them off, which was, you know, the thing about the space aliens and all this stuff, which was highly, highly confidential. So, you know, I, I, I scanned it and, and put it out there uh, to show what the religion of Scientology uh, consisted of. You know, the space aliens and Xenu and all of these things, which never had been on the internet before. None of these terms, none of these anything had been on the internet before because it was all secret and nobody ever got it out. So when I put it on the internet, that was just too much because it became the, all of the mythical religious parts of Scientology became, became uh, public and could be quoted. So from that point on, uh, it opened a big door, it, internet. And I was the first uh, whistleblower on the internet. So I consider myself having changed society, the direction of society at that point by For the just second saying, time. Hey, well, I wasn't <laughs> thinking of the first time back then. <laughs> yeah, but for the second time. And it was, uh, it was for me uh, 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 a personality changing thing too, because uh, having survived it, and actually done well as a result of it. I've had, I've had contacts with uh, the the, uh, the Cha Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce that I would not have had, um, and because I I was a writer for them and for Johnny Grant and all of these things are because they knew the name. That they knew my my name and what I had well, done. Well, I'm glad I'm glad you benefited because you sure paid a price. I mean, you know, I've written about uh, at length about the kind of harassment Paulette Cooper went through, but you know, you're another person that went through years of just utter harassment and you know, um, mess. You know, the the rat fucking they do with people. You were definitely one of their main targets for years. I was one of their rats. Yeah. It's... <laughs> <laughs> That's true enough. I mean, they look down on me exactly as a rat, you know, with as much as much uh, compassion as one feels for a rat. That's how they felt about me. So it's a heavy, it's a heavy thing. But again, I'm an outsider, right? I'm I put my by doing this thing, I put myself on the outside of what society considers normal. Right. Or what had anybody else had the nerve to do is really what it is. So, I, again, I felt like a, an outsider and uh, somehow I survived it because good people uh, would not let those rights go unchanneled, unchallenged or undefended. And so I got the uh, the almost largest uh, law firm in California, Morrison and Forrester, uh, to voluntarily uh, take my case to the Supreme Court if necessary. And they would not charge me a penny. I'm just like, go along for the ride. So these were some of the best lawyers in, in California, and one of them particularly who led the case, uh, Harold McElhaney. You know, I wonder what motivated, how, how did these people become motivated enough to throw all this effort into my case? Are you kidding? I mean, it was crucial. We're talking about the, the very freedom of the internet. I mean, you know, you talk today about <laughs> battles on the internet. This was crucial, not just... Scientology was not just trying to put no, the genie back right. in the bottle, but Scientology was trying to squelch what could be done on the internet. And that's that's why 1995 is such a pivotal year for online freedom. And then 2008, when, when Anonymous showed up and, and had a similar battle with Scientology, you know, uh, you know, this is this is a crucial time. And I can understand why those lawyers 
would want to be involved in that fight. So yeah, I'm glad you got that kind of representation. Well, for me, it was like a gift from God. It was like, how do I deserve this kind of, you know, I, I'm, <laughs> life has made me humble, if you want, if well, you let's, want to let's, know the let's, truth. <laughs> let, let's move ahead because I, I want, I, like I said, okay. there's three eras we want to talk about. November 1966, the Sunset Strip riots. You were right in the middle of it. Uh-huh. February 1995, Scientology's battle with the internet. You're right in the center of it. Now yeah. we're going to move to December 2021. In those last, in those intervening years, you and I had communicated once in a while. Um, uh, but then you went through a life-changing incident in December 2021, which has really changed your outlook on life a lot. I've noticed that you talk in a very different way on the on <laughs> places like Facebook than you did before. Um, it just seems like a different Dennis Ehrlich. And I want, and so I want you to talk about what happened to you in December, 2021 and, and what your new outlook on things is. Well, um, I had had some, uh, minor seizures, uh, not enough to, uh, send me to, uh, emergency room, but, serious enough to, to, for my wife to take me to the hospital. And then I, and then the medicine I was taking was making me crazy. It was making me itch all over. So I just decided to stop the medicine because an epileptic who has a seizure doesn't remember it as anything major. It's like, oh, what, I just wake up and I'm fine, you know? <laughs> They don't remember the seizure. So I, you know, you don't think it's so serious as it, as it really is. So I just stopped my medication. I had this, what they call grand mal, you know, which means big, bad seizure. And um, the effect of that was when I started coming out of it, I only knew my first name didn't know my last name. I didn't know who my wife was. Uh, I didn't know when it was. I My memory had been completely gone. Like it fried my neurons. Uh, and so I had to rebuild from where I was to where I needed to be. And, and, and you, I remember at the time, didn't you say that you'd almost died? Well, that was, yeah, the, the seizure brought me this close to death. You know, I looked death in the face and it was like, ah, <laughs> when I woke up, it's like, wow, this is, this is where I live. It was like a thrill. You know, I was thrilled with what was, what I was being presented with as my, my life, you know, it was like a new thing being alive it still is. <laughs> it still is a new thing. But, um, and, and so my memory was gone at that time. And I've had to build up my memory uh, little by little, if you understand what I mean. I've, I've had to learn how to spit again without it running down my, my <laughs> that's the kind of level I have to I have to gain back uh, how to tie my shoes without it being a problem, how to put on a, a shirt without it being a problem. I still have a problem with that. So yeah, it's a rebuilding of, of abilities, but at the same time, it's a rebuilding of who I am. What came out of the seizure was like an animalistic dentist. Like I had to retrain myself out of that. I don't know. It it reminded me of my uh, uh, my Scientology personality because it was it was like, hey, you know, let me let me do what I want to do. You know, I was fighting hard to, for freedom. You know, you can't tell me what to do. And this was my basic personality all all along is that kind of thing underneath. So. When I got out of it, I, I started coming out of it and rebuilding my 
memory little by little. And I want to say music was a big part of that because I'd forgotten all about how to play guitar and, um, and, and the songs that I knew. And I had to remember all of them. And it was like learning them all over again, wow. you know, o only slower and more deliberate. <laughs> so I feel that that has really carried me along, you know, like this, trying to work through what was distracting me as I play. Um, sometimes while I'm playing, I make a mistake and I can't remember what song I'm playing. And I have to go back to the paper and look at what song was I playing there. Wow. And that's the kind of memory things that I have. And uh, so that was a kind of an earth shaking uh, situation for me. And my personality came out completely different from what it was before. You know, I'm really friendly with people. You know, I, I make a real effort, whether they care or not, to be friendly to them. So uh, I consider that a good personality as far as I, that I, I'll, I'll stick with that one. If you know what I mean, I've had a lot of different personalities, but I'll stick with this one. Um, so, yeah. And well, let me tell you, we had such a pleasant lunch and uh, I, I, I do feel like you have, I remember on Facebook, you, you wrote this really interesting thing where you were explaining to people, your friends, Look, I've I've had this near death experience. I'm starting over. I need to I need to meet you again. I need to learn who you are again. And I don't know. I that made me emotional, Dennis. I I just thought this is such an amazing <laughs> thing this man I admire is going through. And uh so what is it what has it been like these last 2 years meeting people all over again and and putting your life back together? Well, I've I've specifically kept to myself, you know, with under the under the under the umbrella of COVID, right? I've used that as part of, but I'm still after COVID is gone, and I never caught it. So after it's gone, like it is now, basically, uh, it's I it's not. It's not uh, something keeping me from going out. It's myself. I don't know how to act in social situations. I don't know how. I have to rebuild that ability. And I never had that ability either. So I have to learn that ability or get used to that uh, in order to sort of uh, finish off the job of recreating myself. Hmm. And with your new perspective what do you look at what you went through in the 60s uh do you look at what you went through with scientology a little differently now i've always looked like i've always thought of these things the first two events that we, you referenced uh, the riot and 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 the thing of sign of Scientology uh, uh, changing the course of 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 history with regard to the internet and Scientology. Uh, I've always looked at it as if, hey, those are things I did, and probably I got another thing to do. Probably I got another thing to do. What it is, I have no idea. But I didn't have any idea about those other things either. So uh, that's my perspective. It wasn't like, uh, oh, yeah, this was a big deal. No, it was just part of who I am. This is part of my personality to have done that. It, no big deal. It's I carry who I am around with me no matter what other people may think. I don't really, I'm not that interested in what other people think of me. So when we had that conversation, I, I realized this guy looks up to me in a way. And that was shocking because I look up to you, Tony, and, and the kind of uh, journalism you do and how you keep up with it, I don't know. And, and it all makes sense when it comes, you know, when it comes to what you write. I don't find anything strange about it. I find the perspective to be good. So anybody who's giving you any shit, 
ought to shut their mouth because they don't know what you're ta they're talking about, okay? And that's just <laughs> seriously, folks. Well, I, give I the guy that, some breathing uh, room. You know, look, we, we both know how chaotic the whole field can be. I mean, I can't imagine what it was like at ARS when you were, uh, you, were you know, fighting things out then. I mean, I... I, I I, my first story about Scientology came out in November 1995. So uh -huh. I was around that crazy year, but I really had no idea what you and some others were going through that year. And I've always kind of wanted to go back and explore that year. I've never really had a chance to, but I'm so glad that we're getting a chance to talk about it today because I don't know how many, I know people, when they think of like the old days, they think of Anonymous, which was... 16 years ago now this month um but really you know 1995 was in some ways more important than the anonymous movement because 1995 was when scientology made its play to try to strangle internet in, uh, criticism in its crib and you right. and tilman hashur and corinne uh, spank and arnie lerma and, uh, you know, Tom Clemens Rood, who passed away, uh, I guess, a couple of years ago, you guys fought to keep things free. And I just I, I, I don't think you've ever gotten the credit that you deserve on that. Well, thank you very much, Tony. And uh, I don't think you've gotten all the credit you deserve either as a journalist. So, you know, someday I see a Pulitzer in your future. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm thinking about it anyway. My postulates. Okay, are you, post for you. <laughs> you postulate that. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, so, anything else about? Tell us a little bit about what you're doing now. You you've got a ministry. Tell us about that a little bit. Well, I've had a ministry uh, since I don't know when. You know my memory uh, since a long time. And uh, it's all about uh, helping people reorient into society after they've, after they've been in a cult or how to sort of uh, have their family re uh, react to their child in the cult or their child coming out of a cult. Oh, wow. Cult. I didn't realize that. So, yeah. Um, and and uh, counseling of Ex cult members on 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 their emotional problems that, and, and they have a lot a lot of emotional problems and and you know I'm not uh, I'm not sectarian at all and I don't try to push anything and I'm not one of these people who try to talk a, a other people out of uh, what they believe I I only want to show them something different and uh, I find that helpful to because I have a different perspective, I can talk to people from a diff different perspective. And so I've made myself an insider to myself after having been an outsider for, for, for so long. I, I embrace myself. I embrace life. And, and I'm doing a countdown because I know death is just right around the corner for me. So these are precious moments, and I want each of them to reflect the love I have of being alive, just how cool it is to be alive, <laughs> and what a miracle that is. It's so, so great that you're helping other people that basically were in your situation. What what do you find is you know, like one of the toughest things mentally for someone to figure out when they're making that that transition from being in that organization to being free? The worst mental problem is how to fit in back into or into society that they don't, you know, that they have to shift their whole thinking around to how other people think. Because the thinking is so from 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 Scientology's brainwashing technology is so invasive, it's almost and, and it's so repetitive. So there's a whole uh, a, a neuroscience involved of keep repeating the same thing. Your, your neurons get a, a path that they like and, and they stick to that. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a. Um, 
it's something that's captivating in a way to to be involved in this travel to another better world and be part of that. It, it's a uh, it's fascinating and it's uh, seductive to a certain kind of people. And uh, those people are usually good people, usually are good people who get sucked in. But there's a, there's a technology they use on enemies that they are required by their religion to use on their enemies or people who speak out and reveal things about them, which uh, which uh, they're pretty effective at carrying out this kind of a sacramental uh, uh, activity. Um, so, what else? No, that's what I mean. Look, you like? that's uh, that you're explaining it very well, and I, I I appreciate that because you know you're somebody who is helping other people get out. You're talking about you know, helping them reorient themselves. You're obviously a very compassionate uh, counselor or whatever minister. Um, and I, I just think that this new sort of feeling you have uh, can only help you with that sort of compassion and, and, and sympathy for other people. But that old fiery Dennis is still in there because you're still, even if you have uh, changed in some ways, I can still see that fiery Dennis who fought Scientology so publicly and, and was such a, having to pay such a cost. And uh, I'm glad to see that, 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 that spirit is still there as well. Yeah. I'm back to stay. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out world. I'm back to stay. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's perfect. All right. Well, Dennis, I'm so glad you reached out to me when I was out in LA last week that we had lunch and that we could have this conversation. And I know there's plenty more. I know you can go into more detail on the technology itself. And I'd love to talk about that again some other time. But this was just, I think this went really well. And I'm so glad you came on the podcast with me. Well, our meeting together, our, our lunch together was enervating for me because nobody has particularly had much interest. <laughs> <laughs> and so I felt, you know, wow, maybe I'm not a complete failure in life. <laughs> well, like I said, I, you're 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 one of the main OGs of all time, and I'm so glad that I finally got to meet you and hang out with you, and and then have this conversation. And I really believe it that a lot of us owe you a huge debt of gratitude for the fight that you had to go through in the '90s the prices you paid, we, you know, this organization needs to be examined closely and watched and we can do that freely now. Thanks to you. Wow. Uh, my heart, my heart. I can't take, I can't take this kind of talk. Stop it. Stop it. No. Uh, I appreciate the, the sentiment, uh, the sentiment <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, thank you for thanking me and uh, to all of, all of my fans uh, out there and uh, people who haven't heard of me, uh, just ask Tony about me. You right. know, I'm, a Mr. <laughs> I'm Mr. Superman as far as he I'm your PR agent from now but, on. Okay, Dennis? Exactly. Okay. You're hired. Thank you so much, Dennis. I'll talk to you later. Hey, my pleasure, Tony. Anytime.